The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. And so if you're waiting for all the theologians of the world to endorse and embrace the truth of God's word, it's not going to happen. They did not do it back in the time of Jesus. They did not do it for John the Baptist. They're not going to do it for the second coming either. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. Let's go to our study for tonight dealing with our historical John the Baptist, the voice in the wilderness. Jesus said, speaking of John, that he was the greatest of the prophets. Now you might wonder why the Lord would say that about John, because of course you've got Elijah and you've got Elisha, but Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, Matthew 11, 11, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. The Bible doesn't tell us that John the Baptist wrote a book he did not go to heaven in a fiery chariot like Elijah did. Why would the Lord say that? The Bible tells us that John the Baptist had a work very much like that of Elijah who went to heaven in a fiery chariot. Matter of fact, the angel told John's father that he would go forth in the spirit and the power of Elijah. One time the religious leaders came to John and they said, Are you Elijah? And John said, No. And then later, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, if you can receive it, this is Elijah. And some people wondered, is that a contradiction? John said, no, I'm not Elijah. Jesus said, yes, he is Elijah. Because the religious leaders were asking, is this Elijah reincarnated? John said, no, you misunderstand. Jesus said, yes, this is the one who was to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. The Bible does not teach reincarnation. That's why John said, no, because they were asking the wrong question. Jesus said, yes, he has the work of Elijah. Now, you know, in the same way that God sent Elijah to bring revival among his people, and God sent John the Baptist in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the world for Jesus' first coming, God is going to send an army of Elijahs, the 144,000, to prepare the world for Christ's second coming. Notice the prophecy in Malachi 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's not only talking about before the time of Christ, but before the second coming of Jesus. He's going to send the Elijah message. We're going to look at the life of John the Baptist and Elijah a little bit, see if we can learn some lessons from their spirit-filled lives that we might duplicate. Amen? Before I go any farther, can I please issue a disclaimer? This lesson is for those of you who have made decisions to accept Jesus. This lesson goes into the specifics of how to live a holy life. If you have not yet given the Lord your heart, this lesson is going to be very difficult for you to understand because first you must give Him your heart and then these other things become very easy to digest. So this lesson is for those of you who have accepted the previous invitations to invite the Lord into your heart. Now that I've made that clear, let's go forward. What was one secret of John's spirit-filled life? All right, answer, Luke 3, 16. John answered and said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. And let's go to the second part, John 3, verse 30. John said, He must increase, speaking of Jesus, but I must decrease. One of the characteristics in John's life was he had a spirit and an attitude of humility. As Jesus became popular and disciples and apostles gathered about him, some of John's disciples said, it's not fair. He's got more followers than you have. And John said, that's the way it's supposed to be. My job was to introduce him. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, that's a very important statement. Matter of fact, I'd like to invite the world to say that with me. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, that's the secret to victory. Christ must grow and increase in you. We all get in trouble because of selfishness. I, I, I. I must decrease. He must increase. And that's how you find happiness as a Christian. 
All sin is the fruit of selfishness. Question number two. So John was humble. Number two, did John the Baptist read the scriptures? Was he a Bible-based prophet? Let's look at the answer. John 1, 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as says the prophet Isaiah. And that means Isaiah in Greek. So obviously, if he's quoting the prophet Isaiah, and when you look at the statements of John in his preaching, there's only a few, he spends quite a bit of time echoing Scripture from the Old Testament. John was very well acquainted with the Scriptures. He had stored them in his mind. He may have been friends with those who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, that group of Essenes who were sort of the protectors of the oracles of truth. So he had a very high regard for Scripture. If we would like to have a Spirit-filled life as John had, you know, the Bible tells us that John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb right up to the very end. If you would like to have that kind of life, if you would like to do the work of John the Baptist in preparing the world for Jesus' second coming, then we need to have a personal relationship with the Lord through reading the Word on a regular basis. We need to pray on a regular basis. The Bible tells us that Daniel prayed three times a day. Daniel probably read in Psalm 55 where King David said, morning, evening, and at noon will I pray. We need regular appointments to commune with God to build that love relationship. Now, you know what John said? I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. What does that mean? Back in Bible times when kings would travel, they would go with their chariots or their buggies. Now, they did not have highway departments to maintain the roads. And so when the kings would travel, they sent a crew of servants on ahead that would fill in the ditches that would cut off the high spots, that would straighten out these sharp curves to widen the road to accommodate the chariot of the king. And they would announce the king is coming, the king is coming, and they'd fix the road and they'd prepare the people to receive him. This is the work of God's people today. The king is coming. We are to cut off the high places. There are some people who are proud and we're to share with them the life of humility. Some people don't think they're good enough. We're to build them up and fill them in. I heard one pastor say the job of a minister is you need to make the comfortable uncomfortable and you need to comfort those that are too comfortable. We've got some in church who are Laodicean falling asleep and you need to wake them up. Then you get the other th people who think I'm not good enough and you need to comfort them, right? And so that's the balanced job of the minister is to uh, help people wherever their needs are. Chop down the high places, fill in the low places. Number three, was John the Baptist willing to witness for Jesus? John 1:29. Yes, he was. It says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Part of our work as Christians is to invite people to behold the Lamb. Why is this? Jesus said, If I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. One of the first steps, let me ask you, what's the first thing a person needs to do to be saved? I hear someone say repent. I always hear that. That's because the people said to Peter, what should we do? He said, repent. Well, that's not step one. Peter said repent after he had shown them Jesus. Step number one is you must see the Lord. What was the process of Isaiah's conversion? Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. Then he saw himself and he repented. Then he saw his sin and then he repented. Step number one is they need to see the Lord in his goodness and in his glory. Isaiah saw the Lord in the year that his king died. Isaiah was a good king. In the year that his king died, he saw the Lord. You and I need to see the Lord in the year our king died. And when we see him on the cross for our sins, that helps us realize that we need to repent of our sins. That's why the people said to Peter, what must we do? And he said, repent. But first they need to see the Lord. That's what John did. Behold the Lamb of God. That is our work. Amen? Number four. Was the straight preaching of John popular among the political and religious leaders? Luke 7, verse 30. The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. You know, some people, uh, they say, Pastor Doug, if the Sabbath truth is as you say it is, if it's on the seventh day, then why don't the religious theologians and the intelligentsia and the professors, how come they don't see it? Well, friends, have things changed? When Jesus came the first time, did the religious elite, did the professors and doctors of the law, did they accept him? 
when he turned the world upside down, it was the fishermen who believed and received. Amen? Things are not going to be any different. God often chooses simple instruments and people with open hearts to do great things. And so if you're waiting for all the theologians of the world to endorse and embrace the truth of God's Word, it's not going to happen. They did not do it back in the time of Jesus. They did not do it for John the Baptist. They're not going to do it for the second coming either. Jesus said, Moses said, do not follow a multitude to do evil. Amen? You've got to follow the Word. If you're waiting for the biblical truth to be popular, it's never going to happen, friends. I'm telling you right now. You've got to make up your mind not to follow the crowd, but to follow the Lord. The religious leaders refused and rejected him. They crucified Jesus. And it goes on to say also it was not politically correct. Luke 3, 19 and 20, but Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for all the evils which Herod had done, he shut up John in prison. The government did not appreciate him either. You'll be hated by the church and by the state. You listening, friends? If you want to be an Elijah, a John the Baptist, you're going to be persecuted for your faith. Okay, number five. Everybody, take a deep breath. Here we go. Around the world, all at one time. <sighs> okay. I want to make sure that you are able to take this in. I don't lose anybody here. Question number five. Does the Bible discourage the wearing of jewelry in fancy clothing? Uh, the answer is yes. But now let's give you some scripture. Okay, 1 Timothy 2.9. In like manner also, and you call out the answers with me here in New York City. In like manner also, that the women, and of course men, adorn themselves in modest apparel, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. 1 Peter 3.3. 3, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning, of the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold. Now, I want to stop right here. Someone said, doesn't that mean you're not supposed to braid your hair? Is that a sin against braiding your hair? No. In Bible times, the prostitutes used to weave gold chains in their hair as sort of an advertisement. And so Peter is speaking about this. There's no sin in a woman braiding her hair, putting it in a ponytail. It's not what he's talking about. I'm saying that because a question came in asking if it was a sin to braid hair. Not with the broidered hair, but what is it we're supposed to adorn ourselves with? or a gold or putting on of apparel, but, 1 Peter 3, verse 4, 3 and 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, the Bible tells us your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Where was the gold in the temple, on the outside or on the inside? It was on the inside. The outside was pure white marble. On the inside is where all the gold was. The Bible says it should not be the outward adorning for Christians. It ought to be the inward treasure. People should be attracted to us because of what we have on the inside, not what we're wearing on the outside. And yet, even among Christians, and I want to issue another disclaimer, I don't think Christians should wear jewelry. I know there are going to be a lot of Christians in heaven that did wear jewelry. But I need to tell you plainly, and incidentally, if there's anyone watching or anyone here in Manhattan and they've got jewelry on as I cover this subject, don't stare at them, please. <laughs> we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. But do you want the Bible truth? Yes. You want me to tell the truth even if it's not politically correct or popular? I'm going to give it... You don't sound very convincing here in New York City. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Yes. Isaiah chapter 3. Now, you ought to read this. This is a passage where God talks about the daughters of Zion that are proud. And he identifies, and they're going to be lost, he says. You read it here, Isaiah 3, verse 18 to 21. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet. Now, I want to stop right here while you've got that picture on the screen. Are you aware that much of the jewelry in the world originated with pagan roots? People wore things to ward off evil spirits. When I went to India, you know, they've got a lot of the Hindus have the red dot in the forehead. It's to keep the evil eye away. And you go to Burma and some of these other countries, and they're protecting their body from demons by putting these gold and minerals on their body. And friends, I think it brings more devils in than it casts out. It, the, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're supposed to do this. He goes on to say, he'll take away their ornaments about their feet, the chains... Oh, well, that covers everything, doesn't it? The 
bracelets and the mufflers, that's the veils, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, the headbands, the tablets, perfume boxes, the earrings. I didn't hear you. The what? Is that in the Bible? The earrings and the rings and the nose jewels? You know, when I went to India, now, I used to study this for years, and when I mentioned nose jewels in America about 15 years ago, folks said, well, that doesn't apply. It does now. I just came back from India, and those dear ladies, they're beautiful ladies, and in my opinion, it, it, um, the Indian people are some of the most beautiful people in the world, but in my opinion, they ruined themselves. Some of these dear ladies, they'd get these two big old rings on the outside, and they look like running lights, great big old rings, and it scars their noses. And... Uh, it causes other problems. And, you know, the Lord says our bodies are his temple. What would you think of somebody who took a jackhammer and started drilling holes in the temple of God? Now, I tried to find one of the most outrageous things I could find so I could get a reaction. Because, obviously, you think, how many of you think that's going a little far? The question is, how far is too far? How many holes do we need in our body? The Lord gave you the appropriate number of holes at the beginning. No more, no less. He does not want you to add to or subtract from that number. Your body is the temple of God. And back in Bible times, when somebody died, they used to make, they'd mutilate themselves. When they worshiped pagan gods, they'd pierce themselves. Have you read what the prophets of Baal did? They cut themselves. The, the Lord it wants us to regard our bodies as holy. He says, I am holy, you be holy. But back in Bible times, the pagan gods would have their people mutilate and scar and dangle and twist and torture their bodies. And that's what's going on in the world today. And a lot of it is connected with demonic activity, the rock subculture. Oh, well, I better stop right there. <laughs> the Bible says, Luke 16, verse 15, you are among those who justify yourself. Jesus is speaking here. You are among those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Those things that may be very widely accepted and popular among churches and Christians, God says, they're an abomination. Our bodies are to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some more scripture. I, and I'm spending, I'm going to camp out here a little bit. Turn with me to Exodus 33, verse 4 and 5. What did the children of Israel make? the golden calf out of? Their earrings. He said, take the earrings out of the ears of your sons and your daughters. And it's in the ears of our sons and daughters today too, right? And the nose and everything else. Karen and I went on vacation and we saw this man walking around. He had a, a ring in his nipple and one in his navel and a chain between the two. And he was an old gentleman. That just seemed to make it worse because he had tattoos look like wrinkled maps. And I thought, that fellow can get hurt playing volleyball. Do that. And this is what people are doing. It's, you know, I, I think it's, it's going too far. But let's read the Bible. All right. Exodus chapter 33. They made this golden calf. A lot of them died. The Lord ground it up and made them drink it. He said, if you want gold, it's going to be on the inside. And verse 4, when the Lord told them that they were under curse, it says, When the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come upon you in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thine ornaments from thee, that I might know what to do with thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. He was trying to prepare them to enter the Promised Land. They came out of Egypt and adopted all the customs of the Egyptians. You know what's happening to the church in the world today? We are little by little adopting the customs of the world. God wants us to be a pure, simple people. That's probably not enough. Go with me to Genesis chapter 30, what is it, 34, 33, 35, sorry. Genesis 35, that's page 57. Jacob is going to present himself before the Lord. And then verse 2, Jacob says unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your clothes. He says in verse 3, and let us arise and go to Bethel and there I will make an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress that was with me in the way which I went. 
Then they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob buried, he hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. They buried him. We're going to present ourselves before the Lord too. We've learned from God's word that we are now living in a time of judgment. And if there was a time you could wink at what people wore in the old Testament and years ago, it's not time to wink at it now, friends. Now God wants us to be holy. He wants us to be pure. He does not want us to conform to the world. You know, some people say, well, Doug, you're making such a big deal over a little issue. Um, a little bit of jewelry tastefully worn would be appropriate. How much is too much? One reason that I, I don't even wear a tie clip. I know you might think that's fanatical, Doug. But let me tell you why. I don't want to do anything to make someone else stumble. Here's the principle as an example. When I pastored my church in New Mexico of Navajo Indians, as a matter of fact, our last meeting, one of my Navajo members was here to visit me. He's working in New Jersey now. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the Navajos are born with the alcoholic propensity, all of them. Now, that's not true of everybody, but they've studied it. It's a condition. If Navajo Indians drink, I live with them. I'm not being derogatory. It's a fact. They drink until they're out of money or they're out of alcohol or they pass out. It's a terrible, terrible plague on the reservation. And I've just seen wonderful, noble families. And when they start letting alcohol come in, it just destroys them. When I lived among the Navajos, suppose that I drank one glass of wine a week. Now, I might be doing it in moderation. It doesn't kill too many brain cells. But by my example, they could say, Doug drinks. If I drank half a glass of wine once a month, they could say, Doug drinks. How much wine do I need? I don't need any. There's plenty of other things to drink, right? And so, because I love my brother and I don't want to do something that would hurt him, I don't drink any. A person might say, well, Doug, I'm, just, I'm going to tastefully wear a couple of modest earrings. You know, I feel kind of undressed without them and, and maybe a ring or two. And I'm not getting carried away. Well, that's true. You could say that. But, you know, some people are insecure about their appearance. A lot of people are insecure about their appearance. Television and the movies accentuates that insecurity. We all feel like we're imperfect because everyone seems so perfect in the media, right? And some people think they can increase their value by covering themselves with more valuables. I went to a store the other day, and there was this girl. She had earrings just all wrapped around the ear, you know? And I thought, this is going to go out of style. You're going to have holes all the way up and down your ear. I wanted to ask her if she was able to pick up any radio frequencies because she had so much metal... <laughs> all around your ear. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Someone might say, well, what about makeup, Pastor Doug? I figure, what have I got to lose? I may as well hit this. I'm going to hit it hard. And we're going to move on, right? The principle for the Christian is you want to do what Jesus would do. I can't picture Jesus painting himself up so that, you know, he looks like a clown. My philosophy is if you've got so much makeup on that people know you have it on, you have too much on. You want to look as a Christian as simple and natural as you can be. You don't want people to be distracted with all the blue goo and the green and the sequins and things that they're putting into the makeup today. I'm not saying it's a sin, but I think the idea for a Christian is you should be as simple and natural as you can be. We ought to be clean, amen? Our clothing doesn't have to be rags, but it should be modest and it should be simple. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says they made aprons of fig leaves, mini skirts. God said that's not going to do. He gave them robes of skin. The words were different. God says you're not covering using the right material and you don't have enough material either. God gave them robes. Why do we wear clothing? To stay warm? No. I'm warm enough right now. Should I strip? Please, no. <laughs> modesty, is that right? And so one of the reasons we clothe ourselves is for modesty. Keep in mind that in the Bible there are two women in Revelation. Am I right? Those two women represent the church, the true church, the false church. Neither of those women ever open their mouths. We know who they are by virtue of what they have on. One of them is clothed with the sun, moon, and stars. She's clothed with a light that God made. Jesus said to the church, you're the light of the world. The world church, the artificial, is gold and pearls and precious stones and purple and scarlet and all this artificial man-made adornment. Christians should be humble people. So when we start doing things to attract attention to ourselves, is that the spirit of Jesus? If you're waiting for the biblical truth to be popular, it's never going to happen, friends. I'm telling you right now. You've got to make up your mind not to follow the crowd, but to follow the Lord. 
all sin is the fruit of selfishness. People should be attracted to us because of what we have on the inside, not what we're wearing on the outside. I must decrease, he must increase. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain, the birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation of evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. Hi, friends. Amazing Facts is so excited to tell you about our new Prophecy Study Bible. It's filled with everything you could ever want in a Bible. It's got the maps, red letter edition, concordance, and all 27 of the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides are in here to help you in your personal study and to help you study the Word with your friends. If you'd like to know how you can get a copy of this incredible study Bible, call the toll-free number on the screen or go to our website, amazingfacts.org. Friends, love is said to be one of the most powerful emotions. It can cause tremendous joy and also deep grief. Love expressed between humans is sometimes conditional based on how someone else might treat us. But God's love for us is unconditional. Because of his love for us, he has given us guidelines in his word on how we should live and treat other humans. Our emotions are not an accurate indicator on what is biblically right or wrong. When we govern our thoughts by the principles of God's Word, our whole perspective changes. That's why we want to offer you a wonderful study guide entitled, A Love That Transforms. This study will share practical steps on how you can have a joyful Christian experience. Please call our toll-free number and ask for offer number 710. Or if you prefer, simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 710, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, our time is up for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Don't forget to contact us at our website on the screen below. God bless you. Until next time. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated.